Good morning, everybody. So, I have a question for you. It might have occurred to you. Why is Echo Parenting and Education hosting a conference on developmental trauma? Had, any, had that crossed anyone's mind as a question? Anybody got any ideas? Right, developmental trauma happens during childhood, um, particularly uh, during the ages of zero to three, it might happen and you don't have any memory, so you don't even know that it's happened to you. There was a gentleman over here who suggested the reason we're doing it was to make money, but he's completely wrong. <laughs> so, all right, well, let me just, uh, one, more. Oh, one more here, okay. He's saying it's a covert public health issue. I like that. I like the way that you phrase that. Um, so I'm going to construct something for you. I'm, I don't give people quick answers. I make you listen to long, long speeches before you get... No, I'm, but I do want to just set this out a little bit because I've been thinking a lot about it. So let's just start with the trauma part, first of all. And we have Janina here, who's going to be talking to you as our keynote speaker about trauma. Um, and we have, I think, 22 speakers in all. And they're all going to be touching on the subject of trauma. And so there are very many more qualified people than me who will give you a really good breakdown of what trauma really is. But I'm just going to look at it in a very simplistic way. So can we agree that trauma is a response to feeling unsafe or being unsafe. And one of those responses is there's an alarm center in your brain. I like this so much better when I have slides because I have this little red and white siren thing going off in the brain. So you have to imagine that. So that's your alarm center in your brain, otherwise known as the amygdala. Um, and when you feel unsafe, the alarm center is telling the body, okay, I need to do something. I need to fight, I need to run away, or I need to play possum. So that's one aspect of what's happening with trauma. The other aspect is an elevation of the stress hormone, cortisol. And I'm sure our very, um, very erudite speakers will be telling us exactly what the effects of that cortisol is. But believe me, it's not good. It's not good to be walking around with high levels of cortisol. Um, so what is the opposite of that state? I've talked about trauma. What, do you, what would you say was the opposite of that state? Well-being. Yeah, well-being. Sounds about right. Any other volunteers? Pardon me? Calmness, yeah. So it's not just about being safe. If the option was unsafe or safe, I think life would be pretty boring just to spend it safe. Uh, there's also well-being, and there's also joy and love and bliss, which I think is the polar opposite of being in that place of fear and constriction. So. Just as we have this stress hormone, cortisol, raging through us when we're experiencing trauma, have you ever heard of the hormone oxytocin? Are you familiar with that? It's known as the tend and befriend hormone because it was first identified with women when they're looking after their babies or this rush of oxytocin. Um, it's what uh, propels you to go and find help when you're in a difficult situation. It's the oxytocin wanting to uh, connect you with the support system. And as human beings, we're wired to be experiencing this oxytocin. First of all, no babies would get made without it because it's also produced when you have orgasm. Just, just letting you know. Um, there is an experiential part of this. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so anyway, it's very important for our su survival as a human race. Um, and where I'm looking at it now is, is particularly in that caregiver 
child relationship. Um, so a safe, stable, nurturing relationship with a caregiver. The safe means that your amygdala goes, oh, okay, I can relax. The connectedness with your caregiver is what's producing the oxytocin. So what is this thing, developmental trauma? A couple of weeks ago, I was lucky enough to go and listen to Bessel van der Kolk. Has anyone ever heard of him? Bessel van der Kolk, he's one of the trauma greats. He was uh, in Cambodia after the Khmer Rouge. He set up the trauma center on the East Coast where Janina worked for many years. Um, and he has a theme tune. And uh, <laughs> so Bessel, Bessel is amazing. And he was talking about developmental trauma as where attachment meets trauma, which I think is a very good description of what it is that we're looking at here. And one of the things that's very interesting about the emerging research is when we're talking about these loving, connected relationships, we're thinking the opposite of that is someone who beats their kid or a kid who is sexually abused. And the emerging research shows us something very different, that the most severe and pervasive form of trauma comes from emotional abuse, especially if that physical and sexual abuse happened outside the caregiving circle. So it makes sense, really, doesn't it? Because if uh, that attachment, that connection is broken, that baby or that child is going to feel really, really unsafe, and that's going to have the most long-lasting effects. So clearly the child raising element is really important here and there's your answer. That's why we are hosting, convening this conference on developmental trauma. But you might say, well, there's parenting program 10 a penny. You know, you put your finger in the yellow pages, you'll find a parenting program. So why nonviolent parenting? Well, there's a very good reason because a lot of our traditional parenting methods actually elevate cortisol levels. They actually cause dismay, and they're designed to do that. Now, that'll teach you. And our founder, Ruth, is going to be talking in a bit about nonviolent parenting, so I'm not going to step in the, in the shoes of the master. But um, suffice to say that most of us don't have alternatives to this punishment, reward, paradigm. And there are several domestic violence shelter um, directors and workers here today, and many of these shelters we've worked with. But one of the problems that workers in a domestic violence shelter and survivors in a domestic violence shelter have is the kid is acting out, the kid is being disruptive, what do we do with this kid? And so, okay, we know enough we're not supposed to yell at them. Certainly, we're not supposed to hit them. So let's put them in time out. Seems like a good idea, doesn't it? Seems nonviolent. But if that child is disconnected and terrified and needs reassurance, then actually a time out is further punishing that child. So now you're asking yourself, well, what the heck's left? If you've taken my time outs away, what's left? So this is my trailer for Ruth. Do stick around for when Ruth is speaking. And she'll be able to talk to you a bit more about that. But um, you might also think that, OK, domestic violence shelter, traumatized kids, or kids who've been severely abused, that's all very well. But what about you know, regular folk? How does this relate to regular folk? Well, he, here's an interesting piece of news. The CDC did a study with. Dr. Felidi, who was here last year and talked about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And this huge study, 17,000 people, discovered that two-thirds of adult Americans have experienced adverse childhood experiences. So if you think of two-thirds of the people in this room, that's rather a lot of people. And then it stops being about the woman in the domestic violence shelter. It stops being about your client, then it becomes about 
us. I think that you're going to go away from this conference with a new understanding that will reorganize your thinking about service provision and about child raising. And I know some of you are already on this journey. Some of you may already just be cheering from the sidelines because you already know much of this stuff. But I believe that in 150 years, we're going to look at this whole issue of developmental trauma and the way that we parent. And we're going to say, well, of course. Of, of course trauma underlies everything. Of course you can't look at the substance abuser, or you can't look at the homeless person, or you can't look at the person with depression, or you can't look at the person who's self-harming, or you can't look at the person who has an eating disorder without understanding trauma and without understanding why some of our parenting practices have certainly fed in to that trauma. And it was reminding me of, you know about doctors washing their hands before they do surgery? Because otherwise there's a fear of infection. You all know about that, right? You all have seen all the notices in the hospitals, please wash your hands. In restaurants, please wash your hands. You were probably taught since you were tiny that washing your hands is how you stop infection. Well, 150 years ago, they had no clue. In fact, there was this guy called Semmelweis, and he put it together, because in this clinic in Vienna, there were the women, the poor women coming in to the clinic that was being run by midwives, and then there were the wealthy women who were coming to the clinic that was run by doctors. And the rate of infection was way higher for the rich women who were being seen by doctors. And Semmelweis figured it out. It's because the doctors were dissecting the cadavers and then going straight to the childbirth clinic. <laughs> Not a good idea. And so his discovery gave him the name, the savior of mothers. His work uh, was hailed as being uh, what brought a huge change in the way that people understood about infection. And the interesting thing is that before then, they had this miasma theory. They thought that infection was caused by foul air or contaminated water. They didn't believe it was spread between individuals. Does that remind you of anything? Because that's a bit like us, I think. When we think about trauma, we used to think, oh, yeah, people who come back from wars. I found out from Bessel that actually the PTSD diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, that was created for returning Vietnam soldiers. So we had this idea, oh yeah, it's war. But actually, the truth is that most of the developmental trauma, or most of the trauma and developmental trauma for sure, that we see is interpersonal. It's caused through interpersonal um, interactions. Interpersonal interactions, Louise, really. Um, so 100 years ago, they'd learned this stuff about hand washing. But you, if you went and had surgery, there was still an 80% chance that you would end up with an infection. And the reason was is because the doctors were really slow to cotton on to something that they couldn't see. And they also were a little bit uncomfortable because the way that they sterilized, where they had this aerosol, and it was very irritating. The substance that they were pumping into there was very irritating. Um, and so if you went to your doctor nowadays, and they said to you, yeah, you're going to have this uh, knee surgery, and um, don't worry if you start to see your leg rotting. Uh, it's, it's quite normal. It happens to everyone. At the, in those days, 80% of the people did end up with an infection. And uh, they called it hospitalism. That was the name they gave it. But uh, So they, they figured, well, you know, it's the chance you take, isn't it? You know, you've got to have surgery. Uh, it happens to everyone. Well, traditional parenting happens to everyone. And we can't cure the problems until we understand the dirt that we don't see. So what happened to Semmelweis, you might wonder, this uh, savior of mothers? Unfortunately, like most people who are groundbreakers, who have uh, startling new and innovative 
ideas, like Ruth, our founder, who was laughed out of every room 14 years ago. Poor old Samuel ended up with depression. It was so bad, he went to uh, an asylum. And two weeks later, he died at the age of 47, which is pretty tragic. You see that I go on Google a lot, right? Um, but it was really hard because he was fighting an uphill battle. He was fighting the establishment. And people don't like change. And the establishment doesn't like change. And one of the things that needed to happen was not just telling the doctors, wash your hands. The system had to change. And now we have hand sanitizers. We have basins in the examination room. The system's changed to accommodate the knowledge. And so I do hope that as you're going through this conference, one of the tracks that you'll follow is the trauma-informed, nonviolent standards of care, which is all about creating systems change, helping to create that infrastructure to contain this knowledge. So I'm just going to close with Samuel Weiss's last words. This is pretty sad, isn't it? There's a joke afterwards. No. OK. So, but it, it is pretty sad. But I'm thinking that this could be us talking about understanding trauma. And he said, when I look back on the past, I can only dispel the sadness which falls upon me by gazing into that happy future where the infection will be banished. The conviction that such a time must inevitably, sooner or later, arrive will cheer my dying hour. So, Samovice, savior of mothers, I wonder if we can be called savior of children. <laughs>